afternoon. This is CJ Peterson with The Journey is Real. Today, my guest is Edward Hancock II. We're talking to him about his passion, which is overcoming challenges. And as he says, he is a wheelchair guy in a able-bodied world. And I, I yeah. love that. I yes. love that. He's, kind of, he's gonna try to share his challenges and his successes and how he overcomes a lot of those challenges as he's been in a wheelchair for how long? Uh, been in a wheelchair since junior high. I was born disabled, but I've been in a wheelchair since junior high. And what put you there? Well, it's it's a long story, but the short version is biology put me there. You know, when you hit the the puberty stage and you start, you know, get, hit that rap, rapid growth stage. Uh, like I said, I was born with spina bifida, and as I was experiencing the rapid growth, my muscles just couldn't keep up, mm -hmm. and so I was already using like metal forearm crutches. And, you know, of course, in junior high, that's when you start really switching classes. You know, every class is in a different room. And so you're going here, you're going there. And so at the end of the day, I was too tired to do homework. My grades started slipping and it was just, it was kind of a horrible situation. I mean, I was literally, I was in danger of failing. And in, in a lot of the ways that, you know, a lot of kids, they dream of getting a bike on Christmas morning, literally in seventh grade. Christmas morning, I had a wheelchair under a Christmas tree, and it was the best Christmas gift I could have ever gotten because my grades came back up, my energy level was there, and I was able to actually, I was able to actually, you know, get to where I wanted to be and and have energy reserves left over. I was, I, I, I kind of describe it as I was human again, you know. So the crutches were bringing you down, and the chair brought you back up to where you right, were. exactly. Okay, exactly. for those who don't know, can you please explain exactly what spina bifida is? Um, it's hard to explain it exactly, uh, but it is a birth defect. Uh, and, and keep in mind that, that I'm not a doctor, so this is this is a person with expi with spina bifida explaining it. If you were to ask a doctor, they would probably give you a, a, the vast, a, a the vastly different uh, explanation. But basically, when a baby is is forming, you know, in the mom during the pregnancy, uh, each vertebrae around the, the spinal cord forms, you know, individually. You know, it's it's a collection of of bones. And spina bifida is basically the, a, a certain vertebrae, and it can be anywhere. You can be in the neck area, the, the mid-back, which is the thoracic spine, or the, the lower back, which is the lumbar, even down in the, the, what they call the tailbone or the sacral. Um, one of those vertebrae stops forming. And usually what happens is, it, this is not all, I, I don't, I, it's my understanding that none of the vertebrae from that point form completely, if, if at all. And so whatever nerves are, uh, what, whatever the, the, that point of the spinal cord um, controls in the body, you know, be it, you know, basic walking, flexing your foot or, you know, what, whatever it happens to be, it could be like even breathing. Uh, it can be affected by, you know, sp spina bifida. With me, it's low enough on the spine. It's in the, what they call the lumbar region. Mm -hmm. And so, Relatively speaking, I have a, a mild case of it, but if you were to set, you know, four or five people with my exact same level of spina bifida, chances are very good that due to environmental or whatever, uh, you know, differences, we might have vastly different situations and, and abilities or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what a standard day in the life of you looks like and what the challenges you face in it? Uh, well, the best way to say it is a standard, uh, a standard day doesn't exist. Um, there, there's, in my life, there's no such thing as a standard day. I, uh, you know, being a writer, of course, I, I go to bed when I'm done writing, you know, and, and I, I get up when my eyes open. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, being disabled, there are, are days when, you know, maybe I don't feel like doing, you know, I don't feel like running my errands. I don't feel like, uh, doing my laundry. I don't feel like writing, you know. Um, uh, when you run I, your errands, what challenges do you face? Um, especially by yourself because you weather, don't have somebody to get the chair for you. Right. Weather is a big concern. Um, during, you know, rainy days or like snowing and stuff like that. Uh, matter of fact, one of the, uh, big hazards is snow and ice. If I'm trying to unload my wheelchair in the snow and ice, there's a, a big danger of a fall. Mm -hmm. And, and I have fallen before, you know, fall trunk of my car or, or, you know, the back of my car just trying to, to load and unload. Um, 
you know, just a basic, you know, basic thing like going to the grocery store. Um, you know, most people that are ambulatory on, on two legs, you know, they don't, they kind of take for granted, you know, they're wheeling their buggy out with $200 worth of groceries. And me, I, I, if you see me wheeling out of Walmart, I've usually got three bags of, of groceries kind of stacked up in my lap and there's, you know, about up to my chin. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just kind of have to get what I, what I can get. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I probably go to Walmart or the whatever grocery store about three times, uh, for every one that a, an ambulatory person might go, you know. Now, I, I, I'm a friend of yours, so right. I've heard lots of different stories. One of them was when you first got your car, your new car, there was some challenges and getting it so you could actually drive it. Yes. Uh, well, not only drive it, but even unloading the wheelchair. Um, of course, you know, we have, I, I drive with hand controls. I, my, my feet work. I can, I can move my legs and whatever, but I can't move my ankles. And so driving with foot pedals is really out of the question, you know, because you really need a lot of, you know, left and right control the car. Um, and so that was the first thing was getting the, the hand controls put on the car was, you know, a little bit tougher than usual this time. Mm -hmm. But also uh, getting where I could load and unload the wheelchair, uh, the car, the new car that I have was, was set higher up than my previous car. And so my father, wonderful being a welder, him and his his brother, my uncle Jerry, actually welded together a, some some slats of metal and put them in the where the trailer hitch goes to create a step. For oh, me. that's uh, cool. Yeah. So, and as a matter of fact, I think I think there are still some pictures on Facebook of the step that, that they created. And, and I told my dad one day, I said, you know, y'all really need to manufacture these. I said because I'm not the only one that could benefit from these. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a really a neat idea. So I'm and gonna I, stay on it. You did mention that you are an author, and I know that because I am one as well. Yes. And that's how we know each other. Right. Um, when we go to book shows, mm -hmm. uh, my sister Lydia and I, we usually have like a dolly full of stuff. Right. How do you navigate that dolly full of stuff in and out? Because I know you've done it. <laughs> yeah. Um, most of the time, in, in all honesty, um, I I have like two little pegs on the front of my wheelchair where I put a box, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's one that I can carry. And, and then, like I say, you know, just like with carrying my groceries out of Walmart, I'll put two or three of them in, you know, in my lap if I'm by myself. Um, but typically now I'm actually getting to the point where uh, I usually have a friend or two and it's usually my friend, Jennifer, uh, who's th just the last year or two, she's, she's been to almost every book signing I've, I've done. And she uh, takes the, you know, we have, I have like a little wagon that I unfold and we load it up and she usually wheels it in for me. So it's, when she's not there, it's, it's a little tougher. I usually have to make two or three trips. <laughs> mm -hmm. So people who face various challenges, regardless of what their handicap is, whether they're in wheelchairs or whether they're blind, whether they're deaf, you know, whatever it may be, um, they face stuff every single day yes. that us able-bodied people don't. How do you overcome some of those um, challenges, those stigmas, those, how do you keep yourself encouraged every day? Yeah. Um, that actually uh, goes to my, my upbringing. Um, my, my mother gave me words as a little boy that stick with me. Even I, I you know, I turned 46 in March and these words guide my life even today and not to make a long story out of it, but uh, when I was a little boy, I was, I was at a school where I was the only kid in a wheelchair or, you know, disabled child, not in special ed. And so I was surrounded by able-bodied children and, you know, they were running and jumping and this is before I got the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. and so I was trying to keep up. Well, naturally I couldn't. And so I was crying to my mom, you know, I can't keep up. I can't do this. I can't climb trees and whatever. And my mom wiped my tears and she sat me down and she said, son, you can do anything anyone else can do. You just have to find a different way. And to this day, my, my, that's, like my baseline is to think differently. Like whatever way you tell me to do it, I want to find a different way to do it just because I'm that way, you know? I love that. So. Good. So do you have any other words of encouragement? Like um, hmm. Well, the big thing that I, that I tell people, cause I, you know, I do a lot of, of speaking to uh, different groups, you know, writers groups and uh, groups of disabled people and stuff like that. I, I of course I, tell them, you know, my mom's advice. And I say, you know, that those words are now yours to, to guide your life. But, 
you know, the, the main thing that I tell people is that a disability is, it's not a death sentence, you know, and if you're really meant to do that, you will find a way, you know, uh, if, if you, if you want to do it, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. Mm-hmm. I mean, I basically tell people, um, I have one friend of mine who is blind. Mm-hmm. She was not blind from birth. She actually lost her sight progressively. And I tell her just, you need to find a new way to do it. You want to try to match your clothes, put different textures on different clothes, you know, have somebody help you match them up already. Yep. And you can find, you know, that way to match your clothes. Yep. There's always a way around the norm. Right. And it's almost boring anyway. So. Right. Well, as a writer, I'm, I'm, you know, abnormal by default. So. You know. <laughs> I'll own that one too. There you go. So, yeah, things, you know, the way the world works, there's no hard and fast. Right. There's no actual normal. Like I said, normal is boring. Right. Um, when you have a unique challenge, use that challenge and make it a better you. Make exactly. it you know, better for those around you. Um, how do you combat the awkwardness of, because I know you're an author, getting pictures taken? Because I mean, I know I asked you the other day, do you want me to kneel next to you? Yeah. Like, how do you combat that because some people they're uncomfortable to even ask yeah um you know i really or don't asking to help you in a grocery store you know yeah I, I really um i don't see it as awkwardness i mean a lot of people do see it as awkwardness i think um for me it's just a matter of you know there, there are people out there who have never been around a person in a wheelchair there are people who have never been around a blind person or or, or whatever and a matter of fact, I had never been around a blind person until I was in my twenties and I went to Kilgore college. It was the first blind person that, that I'd ever been around. And so I, you know, from that perspective, I understand. Um, but I just basically try to help them out. I, you know, I try to you know, they say like, you know, you, should I kneel or whatever? And I'm just like, yeah, do whatever, you know, whatever you got to do. I mean, I, their people will stand, uh, they'll kneel, they'll, you know, uh, they'll whatever, um, you know, put me up on a pedestal and they'll be down on the ground or, you know, whatever. Uh, we just, we do what works. And uh, even if the camera person has to get further back just to, to get us both in, uh, there's a picture of me from the Longview Comic Con. Uh, I took a picture with uh, the actor Edward Furlong. Mm-hmm. And he not only, he knelt down and almost got like, like our faces were almost inches apart. And, you know, he was just kind of right there, uh, you know, really next to me. And, and I was like, you know what, there's very few people actually do that. They don't take the time to get in your space, you know, invited or uninvited and I, and I don't mind, you know? And so that kind of told me that, you know, he wasn't afraid of me, mm-hmm. and, you know? And, and the big thing is, you know, I tell people, don't be afraid of me because I'm not going to bite you. I'm not going to bite your head off. I, <laughs> I don't get offended very easily at all. Mm-hmm. So the, the when in doubt with me, ask, mm-hmm. you know? Okay. So can you share some of your stories growing up? Some good, some not so good. <laughs> some lessons oh, you learned gosh. along the way besides someone your mom taught you oh gosh well you know I've always said that uh, you know being you know you and I being being not only uh, author friends but friends in general you know we both were uh we both are you know consider ourselves you know to be Christians and mm-hmm. uh, I, I credit my grandmother with taking me to church she was my first last and only Sunday school teacher and you know, it's because of her that I know anything about God. Mm-hmm. And I bring that up because on the day of my birth, you know, being born disabled, um, you know, my mother had gone through labor and she was very tired. And so my, it was basically up to my dad to make the phone calls to say, you know, hey, we, we've got a new son. And so he was calling his parents and, you know, calling all the aunts and uncles. And he called, he, he had to call my, my mom's parents twice because they were gone at the time. So on the second time when he calls him, my granny picks up the phone and he's, he tells her, you know, we've got a boy and, you know, I guess she could kind of sense the fear and she, and she said, uh, what's wrong? And, you know, my dad told her that, uh, they don't think he's going to live very long and they, you know, they don't know what they're going to do. And, uh, kind of get choked up as I tell the story. Um, but my grandmother, you know, she said, now you listen to me, boy. You go back in there and you tell that doctor that I said God has a plan for this boy. And now you got to understand my dad, six foot four, he's, you know, big guy, 300 pounds, you know, 250, 300 pounds. My grandmother, she was, God bless her soul. She was five foot, nothing, a hundred and nothing. But you can bet that when my grandmother said 
get back in there and tell the doctor I said this, that he marched his hind end back in there and told them what the doctor said. And so they did what they said, you know, what they said they were going to do. And, uh, but they said, you know, he'll probably be dead by the age of two. If he does live, he's never going to walk. And if, even if he does walk, he'll probably be a mental vegetable. Now, my sister would probably argue they got the last one right. <laughs> but, I don't think so, but okay. <laughs> you know, um, you know I, I do consider myself to be a, a, a success story, you know, given the, the, my status as an author. I, I graduated college, you know, so I, I think that the best story I could tell is just that's the story of my birth. Because the story of my birth, I had everything against me. The, the devil was telling everybody you know, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. And one little bitty country woman had enough faith to say, no, God has a plan for this boy. You know? I love Texas women. We're mm -hmm. a feisty bunch. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. What about any challenges in school? Because you mentioned you were the only one that was yes. kept in your school. I um, imagine especially elementary levels, yeah. what that was like. Well, elementary school was actually probably – some of the best years because uh, you know when I started in kindergarten uh, the teacher would assign a child like when we were going from the the main you know the classroom to like the lunchroom or going from the classroom to PE or, or outside to recess my teacher would assign someone to hold my hand because at the time I wasn't even using crutches I was just you know walking uh, what little I could walk and so the teacher would you know, assign a student to, to hold my hand. And it was like, I was like the, the class toy because everybody, everybody wanted to hold my hand. And the boy, girl didn't matter. It's like, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Such a privilege. So, you know, you know that, exactly. And so that, that was probably the, the best time of my life. And then, you know, junior high years was all, you know, they were awkward because, you know, that's when things start happening, happening and guys start noticing girls and girls start noticing guys. And, you know, I wasn't really getting noticed like I like I was really hoping, mm -hmm. you know. But so, so the little toy effect was gone. You know, the two had worn off of the toy, mm -hmm. um, and then you know. But then high school, you know, people started maturing a little bit, and and I, you know, I really didn't have many enemies. You know, I had my bullies in in elementary school and, and junior high, but by the time we got into high school, everybody liked me. Everybody was willing to help me. Uh, there's a story that my friend Mark told, and, and I swear to this day, I don't remember it, but um, I think I was, I was on my crutches. I might have been in my wheelchair, but I think I was on my crutches, and he was uh, in front of me as we were walking down the hall, and he said, well, here, let me hold the door for you, and he, he swears up and down. He says that I snapped at him. I got it, and, to the, and I don't remember it. I don't remember it to this day, but he swears up and down that I did it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, apparently I had a little attitude in junior high. <laughs> so I didn't know well, that. You're facing different things. Yeah, you might have some. I think all of us had a little attitude in junior high, though, to be honest. Well, that's probably true. Because we're all a little awkward. I've yeah. been, you know, this tall since then. And so it's like I grew faster than the kids, than the guys, and yeah. kind of towered over them. But, you know, we all have those stories, those all awkward right. stories. Um, so college, um, how did you figure out what you wanted to do? Uh, well, I've known I wanted to be a writer since I was nine years old. Um, and really, I, I ended up going to, to Kilgore College because I was one of those that I've always been a little bit, which translates to a lot, immature for my age. Um, Have you seen my office? There's no yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, games everywhere in the treehouse. So exactly, um, you know, I, I'm I'm 46 years old and still trying to really decide what I want to be when I grow up. But uh, but you know, seriously, I've always uh, known that I was going to be a, a writer. So, but I wanted to go to college because it was important to my parents. Mm -hmm. And I, I basically say, and, and it's true that that I got a college degree for my parents. You know, more so than for myself. Um, but I also went to Kilgore College, which is a two-year university, a two-year junior year college for four years. I majored in just about everything. Um, I actually, I, I have the distinction of majoring in, I don't remember what it was, but I majored in something for 45 minutes. 
For 45 minutes? <laughs> for 45 minutes. And I went to my first class, decided this is not for me. I went to the counselor's office. I said, this is not, this is not going to work. You know, I said this, I went to the counselor's office. I said, nope, this is not going to work, you know? So. Gotcha. Yeah. So what propelled you to kind of put yourself out there as an author? Because as an author, we don't just write books. We actually go out into public and you right. mentioned you're also a speaker. How um, do you, cause that's awkward for anybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I inherited the gift of gab from my mom. Um, she was in insurance for 25, 30 years. And, you know, she's the type of person that she could take the hat off your head and sell it back to you. Um, I, I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not a salesman, but I do have her, her gift of gab and, and her friendliness and, and my father's charisma. So, you know, online sales and whatever uh, book were kind of, they got off to a rocky start. Mm -hmm. But whenever I would talk to people about my books in public, you know, at a restaurant or whatever, they would almost always buy it. And so I just got the brilliant idea that I was going to start going to libraries and, and stuff like this because I had heard a, a, an author, a friend of mine, Terry Burns, he's also, or he was an agent. I don't know if he's still an agent, but uh, he was talking about how he went to libraries in small towns and big towns alike and that, you know, he made pretty good money there. And so in 2010, I started going to libraries and different things. And at the time, Hastings was still around, mm -hmm. uh, Hastings Books and, and Music. And they were really good for local authors. There was a Hastings, of course, in Longview. There was one in Tyler. There was one in uh, Pittsburgh or Mount Pleasant. And then there was one in Paris, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was one around Shreveport, Bossier. I don't remember exactly where, that they actually had me too. And so I was doing really well. Once I got in public and was able to, people were actually able to see my passion. And even though I'm inherently shy, uh, by nature, I was able to talk about my books because I know them, I've lived with them, and, and I truly, honestly am just, you know, when, when people, nine times out of ten, when people see the passion in my face uh, and, and hear it in my voice, that's what sells the book. Mm -hmm. Now, the books you write about the Mendez guys, the Mendez yes. series. Mm -hmm. um, one time I remember you stating something about the fact that he does what you can't do. Yes. And, and uh, is that the reason that propelled the storyline to begin with? or No, um, I, I always say about Alex that Alex is kind of the, the me that I never got to be. That's, that's kind of how I word that. But um, Alex, and I, you know, I, I've actually, it weirds me out when, when authors don't understand this, and, but I know you'll understand it. Alex is real to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I can actually say I met Alex at Kilgore College. While I was at Kilgore College, I was in the Kilgore College Library. Alex walked up to me and introduced himself. Now, no one else around me could have seen it, but it, it was a very real experience for me where I was in the library, and I was near the exit of the library. And I looked over, and there was like almost like a, to use a sci-fi term, almost like a portal mm -hmm. to open up right in front of the door. And like I said, it was all happening in my mind. And this guy walks out of this portal and I'm looking around thinking, I've lost it. I have <laughs> lost my mind. I, I've, I, I've gone off the deep end mm -hmm. because I know that this is only happening in my mind, mm -hmm. but it's as real as the conversation you and I are having right now. He walks up to me and he sticks out his hand and I, reach up to grab his hand and he says hi I'm Alex Mendez and I need you to tell my story and as I grab the phantom hand that was not there mm -hmm. the first book almost it, probably about two-thirds of the first book came to me and I ended up writing through my biology class that day because that was just like I was filled with all these words and I sat down and filled a notebook with with words that day now did that help you also give you some um, courage to continue to speak not just about your books, but about being a wheelchair guy in an able-bodied world? Um, I think so, uh, you know, because it gave me a platform. I wasn't just, you know, random dude in a wheelchair. Right. You know, I was, I was a guy that had actually gone out into the world that had, that had conquered the roadblocks and, and faced the roadblocks 
Um, so yeah, I, I think definitely having the writing career gave me a standing from which others kind of are like, you know, okay, you know, we'll, we'll take you serious. Okay, so any last minute thoughts, because we've only got a few more minutes, <laughs> uh, words of encouragement, um, even of gentle reminders of the fact that, you know, your world is your world, just you have to operate it differently. Right. Uh, I would I would say to the people, to, to able-bodied people, um, first of all, when you meet a person that's blind or that, like myself, is in a wheelchair, um, the wheelchair didn't write the book. It's not a great feat that a guy in a wheelchair wrote a book because I didn't write it with my wheelchair. Mm-hmm. Um, see the person, you know, don't, don't see the disability, see the person. Mm-hmm. To the disabled person, I would say be the person. Don't be the disability. I like it. I love your attitude. I love your heart. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. I really appreciate you. Um, for those, thank you for listening to The Journey is Real, where there's real people with real passions and real hearts. I'm CJ Peterson of cjpetersonwrites.com. While the stories are fiction, the journey is real. Thank you. Until next time. Bye.